Welcome back to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton, and I'm so happy to be joined today by C. Lamar Frizzell. He's the CEO of Cedar Hills Hospital, and he's worked in the field of behavioral health for over 20 years. Most recently, Frizzell held a similar role at Willow Creek Behavioral Health located in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and he brings practical experience both as a line staff member and a person educated in the fields of mental health and divinity. Welcome, Lamar. It's so good to see you. Thank you. It's good to be here. I want to start with divinity because I find that so fascinating. How do you think that your two areas of interest intersect? Uh, People. Um, Loving people is incredibly important in both fields. If you don't, You can't succeed in helping people. I want to go back to your beginning because it's hard to imagine being a young man and saying, you know what, I want to help people who are in mental health crisis. So tell me about your own awakening. Why did you decide that this field was going to be something that was so passionate for you? Well, honestly, I ran from this because my family had lots of dysfunction. Uh, My father was an alcoholic. My mother made three suicide attempts before I was age 10. Each time I found her unconscious and had to get uh, support for her, Mm. fortunately she survived. Um, And I'd had enough of that kind of dysfunction. I was the oldest of three, and uh, I just really kind of ran from that. Mm. But every every, um, aptitude test that I took, uh, every college entrance exam that I, I've, I looked at kept pointing me in that direction, and I would not go. When I was struggling with my own issues of alcohol use uh, as an addiction, I, uh, I was really struggling in my own life. And I had a conversion moment mm. uh, where as a junior in high school, having gone to school, completely inebriated uh, for geometry class, I, uh, I just knew that I couldn't continue to do that because I was walking into the same trap as I felt my parents had fallen into. Mm. And uh, my experience, very individual, I understand, really came to a point to where I admitted my problem and that that problem was at the root of just sinfulness and very bad behaviors and very destructive behaviors and so much pain oh and yes let's not forget the consequence of all of that right Uh, it's fascinating to me that now you're running an organization that sees the very type of person that you were as that junior that your whole business is around welcoming through the door somebody who is as lost as frightened and as perhaps addicted as you were. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it took a lot of adjustments along the way and a lot of redirection in my life from a spiritual standpoint, from uh, a skill set standpoint, f- just from also what I really wanted to accomplish in my life and through my life. Mm-hmm. And finally, I had about a three-year period as a 30-year-old, kind of a crisis of belief. Do I stay as a pastor or do I really walk in this into this field that I'm really finding a home in, and that's behavioral health? And one thing led to another. I had, I did both concurrently for several years, in fact, a decade or so. And then when I got into administration, it was just too much. Mm-hmm. And I had to make a decision, my wow. wife and I we're able to do that. What do you think is the major challenge that you're going to have individually running Cedar Hills Hospital? And also, if you could make it sort of indicative of what's happening in psychiatric hospitals around the country because of the explosion of of people who are very severely ill. Well, it is that explosion that's going to be the challenge because even in our state of Oregon, where there are too few beds, There are so many people, and that can get overwhelming. That can get heart-wrenching, even paralyzing at times when you consider the enormity. But knowing that I have at my disposal resources and opportunities to create perhaps uh, beds, outpatient services, uh, those kinds of things from the 
corporate level down to the hospital, mm-hmm. I, I feel, in, if you will, empowered to be able to do that. So for people who aren't familiar with how the psychiatric systems work and the interplay between all of the systems, let's just talk about somebody who has been on the streets of Portland. Perhaps they're homeless or perhaps they're living in a house in low-income shelter and they've used drugs and now they're in a psychotic episode. What happens to them after they are picked up either by the police or an ambulance or a family member who has taken them to an emergency room? Well, they they do go into an emergency room typically. Uh, the police either escort them or, or an EMT. Uh, once they get to the emergency department, usually a social a social worker will do an assessment. Once that, that assessment is completed, that social worker and other staff members, nurses uh, perhaps, will begin calling, looking for a bed for this particular need and this particular patient. Oftentimes, we will get those requests. Uh, if we have a bed, an appropriate unit, on an appropriate unit, then we are able to receive that patient. Wow. So I have heard about the number of people who often languish in um, emergency rooms for days while they're waiting for a bed to open up. Why is that happening? And is it just related simply to the availability of beds? Or is it because there needs to be a cooperation among all of the hospitals so that the burden is distributed evenly? To some degree, there is some cooperation. But even if that is in place, there's still not enough beds to house patients that number the ones that we have to see. Mm. It's overwhelming the system. There's not enough. uh, Everybody can make the call, but it's being able to say we have a bed that becomes the issue. And I made it sound pretty easy, you know. Right. Please take it to the ED. Yeah. You get assessed and then you get a call right. uh, to a hospital. That can happen and it does happen. But if there's no bed, that patient stays in that emergency room or wherever that patient is until a bed opens. And sometimes that could be hours, sometimes it could be days. Unfortunately, sometimes it could be a couple of weeks or more. You know, what is most unfortunate about that is that's the, uh, not a place for a person to get better. No. They, they generally, if a person's in psychosis, <clears throat> will put armed guards outside the room. There's no activity, no true treatment of a psychiatrist giving them any kind of medication that helps. And a patient might get demonstrably worse in that period of time. Yes. Uh, and the emergency department is no place for a psychiatric patient. Yeah. Because the stimulation there is so overwhelming right. uh, that they can't handle it. Yeah. And it usually, it usually involves over-medicating so as to at least keep them calm to the degree that you can. Right. When I first met you, you, you said you have a theory about <clears throat> running a psychiatric hospital, and that is take care of your staff. Because if your staff is taken care of, then it's going to be much easier to take care of of the patient. But in many hospitals, uh, frontline nurses, psychiatric nurses, and doctors are up against a really difficult patient. They can sometimes be violent. They can sometimes um, spit on them. They can and throw chairs at them. How do you balance that, what you want, uh, the health and the well-being of your caregiver with this extreme state that the patient is in? Mm. I love my staff. Uh, they are very important to me. I tell them regularly I could not do my job if they weren't uh, doing theirs. If I can't give them the resources, I'm failing. Mm. If I can't give them the support and encouragement that they need, I'm failing. If I can't empathize with them to the degree that I need to, well, which I can because I've been where they've been, I would be failing. If I do all of those things toward them, then they know somebody is watching out for them so that they can turn more of their attention to engaging people who are in crisis like you just described. Mm-hmm. If, if I take care of the staff, they can then more freely take care of the patient. In so many psychiatric hospitals, and this has been a big story across the country, is the number of people who have died by suicide. And I want you, if you will, Lamar, just to talk about First of all, the difficulty when someone is intent on dying by suicide, how awful it is to 
attempt to try to bring them into a place of safety because they can be very creative, mm. but also the impact on a staff and a hospital when you do lose someone. What is that like? Well, it's it's terribly personal. It's very emotional. And it becomes an introspective uh, time because when when we do find out or if we do find out that patients have completed suicide and you're always wondering what else could we have done? Mm. You know, what else could we have said? Would another day in the hospital have mattered? You begin to think about those kinds of things. You start trying to think about what you could do in terms of post-discharge follow-up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been some strategies developed that have become helpful in that, uh, but it becomes a very hard, even a grieving process mm -hmm. uh, for for the staff when that that kind of knowledge gets back to us. Because it is such a personal loss. It, it's it's the loss of another human being and a human being in our roles and in our job choices. We wanted to get close to people on purpose, and when we did, and now we, we have to experience the loss with, that comes with that when, when that happens. I know that you have a, uh, because I was able to tour the facility, you have an inpatient unit, but you also have a very active outpatient unit. How would you tell people to determine whether or not they need outpatient or inpatient help? We do a full screening, a psychiatric or, or psychological social screening. We collect a lot of information from the patient themselves, perhaps significant others that are allowed to participate in the assessment process. And then our trained counselors, master's level counselors or nurses with certificates in uh, behavioral health are able to help them make decisions about what levels of care they may need. Mm. So if they come and we are able to make good judgments about the level of acuity and what their criteria for different levels of services are comparatively, then we're able to point them to the right level of care. And even if we were to start at a higher level of care, such as inpatient, they don't have to stay as long if indeed their criteria diminishes and we can step them into a lower level of care. So a partial hospitalization or an IOP or an intensive outpatient. And you also have a very active veterans program there. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, we have a lot of, of uh, veterans that come for various reasons. PTSD is one that most people commonly hear about. So we're able to bring them in and work through those kinds of issues that they face from their training, from their experience in the military. Alcohol and drug uh, substance use is pretty significant. It's really, unfortunately, a, a pretty substantial part of the culture uh, that uh, military life is. And we, we bring them in and we work through detoxing them and then trying to help them to understand how they can move forward in, in a life of sobriety. Mm. And that may start with a few weeks in the hospital and then we step them into a residential type of care perhaps. Uh, or some other outpatient type of care so that they can get continued support. Do you believe, Lamar, that people can recover from mental health conditions? Recover? Not without support. Mm -hmm. That may take the form of medication. Uh, that may take the form of regular to occasional therapy. Mm -hmm. That may take the form of bringing family and other and significant others into your life and learning to lean on people and not being isolated. So there's a lot of things that can help move that forward. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like it's a lot like a, a other disease processes. Really, mm -hmm. if you have CHF, chronic heart failure, you have to take medication and you have to eat correctly, and uh, or you're going to have flare-ups and other issues you have to pay attention to those issues in behavioral health just as much. Yeah, I love I loved that um, comparison with any other disease process because the brain is an organ, right? Yes, <laughs> it, yes. It gets sick and it can also get better with the right support. Right, Yeah. right. And that's an unusual thing. Of People don't really realize that oftentimes, that it is an organ, it does affect the way we think, and if we don't take care of it, it does affect us badly. Yeah.
I want to talk more about uh, the proposed expansion in Oregon and why uh, we so desperately need another hospital, especially in the mid Willamette Valley. What kind of trends are you seeing in terms of the need, the need for more beds, and especially one in this rural area of Oregon? In Oregon right now, Oregon ranks between 47 and 51st in the nation. That's territories and states. Mm. That's terribly low. That means that more resources are needed in Oregon to try to address suicidality, addiction issues, and offering other uh, support to other behavioral health issues. Mm -hmm. There's that great of a need. And whether it's positioned in a, in a rural area like Wilsonville or in a metropolitan area like Portland, uh, beds are beds, and people need that kind of service, and we're behind in being able to provide that for our state. Um, when we referred earlier to this um, system of being able to find a bed, so what you're saying is that even if the need comes from Portland, uh, Wilsonville, if there were to be a hospital there and had an open bed, could receive that patient. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And because the the system that we have set up is supposed to be open to all, I want you to, if you can, to speak about the competitive nature of this. In my mind, there shouldn't be any competition when it has to be something that has to do with a person's life or death. No. Unfortunately, if we try to overanalyze it, if we try to politicize it, even if we try to drive it from a business perspective, really, if you overanalyze it in any one of those ways, you're going to get in trouble in the end and you're going to lose out. Mm. And so when people overanalyze it along those lines, they miss the very nature of the concern, and that is providing more services, and that begins with providing more beds. Whether it's a for-profit or not-for-profit, uh, whether it's a converted administrator like me, or it's one of those people that you referred to earlier that really does have the financial picture well in view. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at things from a very practical standpoint, if you provide more beds, you provide more services, and when you provide more services, you take care of more people. So I do want to talk about the perceived criticism that if it's for profit, that you will be channeling uh, most of the people who have the ability to pay into your system, leaving other systems stuck with people who are Medicaid or can't pay at all. I just want you to address that because what I heard the other night is that, no, if, if a person is in crisis and if they show up at your facility and they need a bed, they get a bed. Yes. If we have a bed, it doesn't matter about the payer. Whoever, Medicaid, commercial insurance, the military, it doesn't matter who's footing the bill or who may not be footing the bill. The answer to the question is, if you have a need and you come to our hospital and we have the bed open at that moment, then you are able to come into our hospital and we will welcome you. Are you scratching your head as to why when so many other states have welcomed in more hospital beds, Oregon is resisting? Oh, yeah. That's the puzzle of puzzles to me. We need more beds. We made that argument today even with a, rep, a representative from our state legislature. We need more beds. It really is about that. We really focus on that. We, we don't focus on uh, a business model. Uh, we focus on we just really want to see this CON, that certificate of need process, succeed so that we can provide more beds. Mm -hmm. I want to know how you think that people can support this effort, especially those who, like my family, had to wait for someone to get care in an emergency room for three days. What can they do to impact their representative, their local media, to understand how essential this crisis is and how quickly we need to act? Well, if they haven't already got the representative's numbers on speed dial, <laughs> they need to because... As being an active participant in the political process, being able to communicate and have a voice to those people who should be listening to you or should be bothered enough, meaning you bother them enough so that they will listen to you, they really have to put forth the effort to advocate. And with that kind of growing advocacy, that message tends to get through. Uh, so nobody should ever give up in regards to what their personal experience has been, 
and making sure that that personal experience, such as the one you just described, is communicated and that there's a better way to handle this issue rather than waiting somebody, making somebody wait uh, languishing in an emergency department when there's services to be had, mm-hmm. if there would just be an openness to that. I really want to welcome you to the community, Lamar. It seems like you're going to be a perfect part of our growth in terms of how we treat people who are suffering from mental illness and just really broadening our understanding of it to accept that all of us are on a spectrum of mental health and it might be us one day who are desperately in need of care. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's it, that means a lot to me, and I, I'm I'm looking forward to being here for a while, a long while, to be able to support this ongoing process of of providing services to our state. Bye-bye.